Well, I'm here with Professor Bill Newsom of Stanford University, who's in Cambridge for the summer. And earlier this week, he gave a research seminar for the Faraday Institute on the brain and free will. And I was just wondering, maybe, Bill, if you could begin by uh, explaining uh, briefly the kind of content of that seminar uh, and what the main focus was. Sure. Uh, Dennis Alexander, actually, it's his fault. It's all his fault. He assigned me the topic of what do we make of free will in a post-Libet world. And his title referred to Benjamin Libet, who was a noted uh, neuroscientist at the University of California in San Francisco, who published a paper in 1983 that has cast a long shadow over psychology and philosophy in the three decades since then. And basically, Libet made a pretty astounding discovery. He, he discovered that if you put subjects in a situation where they're instructed just to move their fingers once every few seconds, whenever they feel the urge, totally of their own free will, and so they're just exercising their own desire when they feel an urge to move their finger as quickly as possible, and you put an EEG recording on them at the same time so that you're measuring brain potentials, there's a certain brain potential you can measure called the readiness potential at the time, although we think it's more the lateralized readiness potential now, that actually begins building. You can see the readiness potential changing, according to Libet, before the subjects became consciously aware that they had an urge or a desire to move. Now, this is a very uncomfortable uh, observation to make from certain, certain from certain perspective because we all tend to think that we're totally in control of our conscious desire to do certain things, our conscious decisions to move our fingers, but the basic message of Libet's result was that, no, some part of your brain is already in process working on this problem and perhaps has decided to move the finger before you're even aware of it. So what I tried to do in the seminar was to sort of review some of the current literature on this topic and sort of critically evaluate it and say, how confident are we that Libet had the story right, that the brain has already decided to move before I become consciously aware of it? Um, or to what extent is it still possible, still in play, that the two events, the mental conscious event and the neural event might happen simultaneously? How good are the data and are there new experiments we could think of? Now, I don't work in this area myself, but I actually enjoyed talking about it because it gave me the opportunity, you know, a reason to go read some papers and sort of delve into very interesting literature. So I kind of try to unpack that in the talk, um, and it seemed to go over pretty well. People had lots of really good questions, and um, man, who knows, maybe I'll even wind up doing some experiments on this in the future, just as a result of Dennis Alexander's little homework assignment he gave me. Uh, it seems that Libet's study had a large uh, impact and influence. Yes, absolutely. Um, since it came out. Yes. Uh, and I was wondering whether you thought that perhaps spoke to some broader social or cultural anxieties or some wider issues as to why that particular study uh, caused quite the impact it did. Yes, it, it caused a huge impact and is still causing um, experiments and substantial discussion in philosophy, psychology, neuroscience circles. Libet's experiment is actually the most famous experiment in the history of neuroscience as far as philosophers are concerned. Uh, if you ask a general biology neuroscience audience if they've heard of Benjamin Libet, you'll get maybe 10 or 15 percent of them to hold up their hands. But if you ask philosophers, they know who Benjamin Libet is and what he did. And the reason why it's cast a, such a long shadow is because it raises questions about this innate, intuitive sense of free will that we have. We all have the sense that when we consciously choose to do something, that to some extent we're operating without prior constraints, and to some extent we have the freedom to move our finger or not to move our finger. But suddenly, if our conscious desire to move our finger turns out to be following along behind other neural processes, that suggests that there are other brain circuits that are actually driving that behavior and that consciously we just attribute free will to that after the fact. And, you know, Libet's experiment is so famous and has caused so much controversy because it calls into question this, this um, sense that we have that our conscious desires and conscious decisions cause the action and raise the possibility that causality is really the other way around that it's the action and the neural processes that guide the action that cause the conscious sensation. Mm. So it raises deep questions uh, about consciousness, how it's related to brain activity, and to what extent we have freedom in these voluntary actions 
uh, that we intuitively feel like we have great freedom about. Now, it would seem that there are obvious implications uh, um, of that for the science-religion dialogue or for a science of religious experience, if you can put it that way. Yeah, I think that um, this question, the question of volition, volitional movement and voluntary movement, and what, how volition and voluntary action cashes out in neurobiological terms, I think this is of interest to people of religious backgrounds and from many religious traditions, because religious traditions have a particular anthropology about humans, some particular theories about uh, the nature of our choices and our religious responsibilities and the choices we make and our responsibility to others for the choices we make. But if those choices are not really choices in some deep sense, but they are uh, wholly determined by subconscious processes that we only become aware of after the fact, then that raises questions about this basic anthropology of humans as, to some extent, free and responsible agents. But we should note, Ben, that this is not just a religious question. Anyone who has a stake in the legal system and wants to have the legal system function reasonably and aligning itself to the truth of biology uh, has an interest in this as well. So I think this is of interest to religious communities and should be thought about carefully by religious communities, this whole debate about volition and neurobiology of uh, conscious awareness and choice. But it's not just religious communities that should be concerned about this. It's of concern to a much broader community. Professor Bill Newsom, thanks so much for your thoughts and hope you enjoy the rest of your time here in Cambridge. You're welcome. I certainly intend to. Thank you.